Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Invasive Muscle Collaborative Webinar, Approaches to Watercraft Inspection and Decontamination Program. My name is Erica Jensen. I'm a program manager with the Great Lakes Commission. And on behalf of the Invasive Muscle Collaborative, thank you for participating in our webinar today. For those of you not familiar with the collaborative, it was convened in 2015 to identify opportunities to advance scientifically sound technology for management and control of invasive dracaenid muscles in order to produce measurable ecological and economic benefits. If you'd like to know more about the Invasive Muscle Collaborative, we encourage you to visit our website at www.invasivemusclecollaborative.net. I would also like to take a quick moment to let you know for those of you who are currently subscribed to our Invasive Muscle Collaborative Listserv, that we are in the process of transitioning our hosting service for the Listserv. And we would like to ask for your patience as we go through the transition and forgiveness for any inconvenience it may cause. Uh, for those of you not already subscribed to the Listserv, we do encourage you to join our Listserv once we complete the transition later this week. And going forward, you will receive webinar announcements, read about recent dracaenid related news, and be able to connect with other researchers and managers. If you have any questions regarding the Invasive Muscle Collaborative Listserv or any trouble with the transition, please don't hesitate to contact us at the Gray Lakes Commission uh, as we work through this transition. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series hosted by the Invasive Muscle Collaborative. And the purpose of these webinars is to facilitate learning and information sharing on topics of common interest within the muscle community. It will be recorded and archived along with past and future webinars on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative website. The focus of today's webinar is watercraft inspection and decontamination programs, and it will provide examples of both voluntary and mandatory approaches. We are pleased to have representatives from the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, the Lake George Park Commission, and New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, Lake Champlain Basin Program joining us to share their experiences with these programs. We also wanted to let you know that we are planning a second follow-up webinar on this same topic that will feature additional examples of voluntary approaches and programs, as we know there are many approaches and programs out there uh, and that we'd like to give uh, opportunity for others to share their experiences as well. So this uh, second part two webinar will be announced shortly and we encourage you to make sure that you're on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative Listserv to receive that announcement. Finally, another technological note for today. For those of you that have participated in our previous webinars, you will have noticed that we've switched our webinar services to Skype. While we always strive to minimize technological issues during these webinars, we apologize for any issues that may arise due to this transition. Further, I'd like to cover a few logistical items regarding using Skype uh, before we get to our presentations. Audio for the webinar is automatically streamed through your computer speakers once you join the Skype event. You also have the option to dial into the webinar using a telephone. To change your audio to a telephone line, select Switch Audio to My Phone from the banner at the bottom of the screen and click Connect from the pop-up screen. A second pop-up screen will list the number to call in as well as the conference ID number to connect to the webinar. In order to minimize the potential for interruptions and background noise, we have automatically muted all attendees. Attendees will remain muted throughout the webinar. We do encourage and will accept written questions from attendees throughout the webinar. If you have a question, you may type it into the question and answer pane of your Skype dashboard. You may view the Q&A pane now and at any time during the webinar. All you need to do is click Content Stage or Presentation in the lower left corner of your screen to return to the presentation. Keep in mind that you will need to toggle between the presentation and the Q&A pane as both cannot be open at the same time. Questions may be submitted at any time during the webinar. Depending on time, we may answer one or two questions following each presentation, but the majority will be addressed after the presentations have been given. Um, we do have one speaker that needs to leave a little early today, uh, and that is Dave Wick. So if you have questions for Dave, we encourage you to submit those during his presentation so we can address them early on. 
We will do our best to take all questions and comments during the webinar. If you need to leave the webinar before we've gotten to your question, we encourage you to review the webinar recording that will be posted on our website to hear the question and answer. Another Skype note, to view presentations in a full screen format, you need to change your screen layout to content view. To change the layout, select the layout icon in the upper right corner of your screen indicated by the red circle on the slide. You can choose presentation view or content view. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, you may send a message through the Q&A pane and we will do our best to uh, answer those and help you address your techno technological issues. Those questions and comments submitted in the Q&A pane are automatically sent directly to us as the meeting organizers. So that is all of the logistical and technical advice I have to share with you this morning. Um, so without further ado, we will move on to our presentation. Our first presenter this morning is Quagga D. Quagga D has been on contract for the Pacific States Marine Fishery Commission Aquatic Invasive Species Program since 2008, teaching the aquatic invasive species industry for the 19 Western states and several Canadian provinces, procedures on watercraft inspection and decontamination. She has attended the Western Regional Panel annual meetings for several years, serving on committees including the watercraft inspection decontamination training, material uniform minimum protocols and standards revision, and the building consensus outreach effort. So welcome, Quagga D. You should be uh, off muted and able to uh, access your presentation at this time. And just a reminder to our speakers, press star six to unmute yourself. See if you could make sure you're unmuted by pressing star six. All right, you should Ready? be good to go, Dee. Everybody can hear me? Good. Thank you for inviting me on this webinar. I'm going to present about the watercraft inspections and decontamination or WIT programs in the West. I have been nicknamed Quagga Diaz. I'm kind of an invasive by nature. I'm spreading throughout the West, training states, agencies, and organizations. This WIT program is funded by Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Bonneville Power Administration, in cooperation with the 100th Meridian Initiative and the Western Regional Panel. While there's a large focus on zebra and quagga mussels, the AIS program is concerned about all species that pose a potential threat to the West. It's difficult to put a price tag on our natural capital, the economical, ecological, and recreational damages that specifically address the ZQM impacts are enormous. The Western states are spending over $10 million annually just for watercraft inspection and decontamination programs. Education and outreach is the most important thing to provide to the boating public or our customers. Each inspection is a face-to-face -face opportunity to educate the boater and change their behavior by teaching them to clean, drain, and dry. One of the tools we have in the West for watercraft inspectors and decontaminators consists of training and manuals you can find on the website. The primary goal is to prevent the transfer of AIS and to safeguard our natural resources. The objective of the program is to keep public and private waters open to recreational use to the greatest extent possible and to provide education to the boating public. The purpose of the curriculum is to create a consistent method of inspections and decontaminations <clears throat> which have been proven to reduce the risk of AIS being introduced through our risk-based prevention and containment program. The student curriculum consists of several components. In the introduction, we're defining what the purpose of the program is about. 
what the mission and the background of the protocols are, water body listing and delisting, and what the other states are doing. In the biology section, we're identifying what they are, their life cycle, the vectors, and where they are most likely to hide on boats. In the watercraft anatomy and risk assessment module, we're reviewing the differences between four categories of boats from hand launch to very complex. Which ones are the lowest and the highest risk vessels? The inspection procedures module is the most important module for WIT. The goal, of course, is for every boat is no mud, plants, animals, or water coming and going. Decontamination procedures are to kill and remove any biological risk that watercraft may possess. Protocols will vary depending on the risk and the complexity of the watercraft. The WIT training is comprised of review of the student curriculum by PowerPoint presentations and practicing the protocols of inspection and decontamination to enhance the skills. The hands-on training is critical for an effective boots-on-the-ground team. 90% of retaining these skills is by doing them. The Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission offers these trainings for those who are implementing watercraft inspection and or decontamination programs for their respective agencies, organizations, or businesses. There are three trainings offered right now. WIT-1 is inspection, WIT-2 is inspection and decontamination, and WIT-3 is trainer training, which I'll briefly go over with you. The WIT-1, or inspection, is a one-day course consisting of eight hours of training. There are different types of inspections. There's entrance or exit inspection, depending on the programs for prevention or containment lakes or reservoirs. They need to ask a couple questions. Where have you been or where are you going? And how long have you been out of the water? Based on their answers, that might trigger a high-risk inspection. So we review the step-by-step -step procedures from greeting the boater, providing them with outreach material, the purpose of the inspection, and to get the boater to understand we are looking for clean, drain, and dry. This course is delivered over two days of training. WIT 2 is inspection and decontamination. It's focusing on additional inspection practice, boat anatomy, along with standard decontamination protocols. In the decontamination module, we discuss the triggers for decontamination and the step-by-step -step procedures. Students attending and performing decontaminations should have a working knowledge of boat anatomy, form, and function. The application for decontamination according to UMPS, which I'll talk about in just a minute, consists of hot water with either low or high pressure. Hot water kills the muscles and high pressure removes them. Based on this scientific research, the temperature time exposure for effective mortality is 140 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 seconds to kill adult muscles. Mobile decon units and their safety, maintenance, and operation are an integral part of the decontamination training. Personal protection equipment, or PPE, is mandatory when operating this machinery. Regular maintenance of a pressure washer machine is necessary to keep it decon ready. Decontamination procedures include having the right tools and equipment. An ideal pressure washer unit has the ability of 5 gallons a minute, 3 to 3,500 PSI, and an operating temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit with proper attachment tools to perform an effective decontamination. There are specifications in the UMPS-3 document available for hot water pressure machines meeting these standards. Trainer training is a three-day course that reviews the curriculum provided. The student manual is the what. They demonstrate their speaking and training ability by evaluations and feedback on presentation style. The how to apply the information is the trainer's manual. The why includes effective adult learning skills. This toolkit is to help to understand learning behaviors and effectively train to that audience. The fundamentals of inspection and decontamination should stay consistent, 
but states, agencies, counties, and organizations all have their own laws and rules they have to live by. This trainer's manual provides consistent guidance to trainers who are responsible for the certification of individuals to perform inspections and decontaminations. Um, the student's curriculum and the trainer's manual together provide the necessary components to implement a WID program. New technologies could reduce the risk of AIS being transported and possibly eliminate the need for decontamination in certain situations, which would help greatly increase the efficacy of WID stations. The Western Regional Panel is continuing to work with all project partners to further production, research, and development of new technologies to reduce the likelihood of invaders hitchhiking on watercrafts and equipment. This page on the Western AIS website has research and technology that dates back to 1985. The Uniform Minimum Protocols and Standards, or UMPS as we call it, was created in 2009, revised in 2012, and again in 2016. It's a live document with science and methods ever changing. It was designed to increase effectiveness by using the best available science and to encourage the most region-wide interception strategy by providing consistent messaging to voters, the public, and policymakers. Three program levels have been identified to characterize inspection activities found across the West. A self-inspection program is relatively low cost where organization or physical capacity prevents a more aggressive approach. One example of this is the Utah Muscle Aware Program. They have voters go to their website and complete the online program and receive a decontamination cert certification form. This form serves as an inspection or decontamination receipt. It gives you the steps of clean, drain, and dry to self-decontaminate, but it also provides the locations for a professional decontamination. The screening interview program can be voluntary or mandatory, which involves collecting information from the boat operator through a standard set of questions prior to launching. These questions are designed to determine the level of risk posed by that watercraft based on its recent history. A comprehensive program is recommended for providing the highest level of protection for natural resources. In general, a comprehensive program is one that can inspect, decontaminate, and deny access or even quarantine a water watercraft. There are protocols and standards outlined in UMP3 of these programs and examples of each listed like the Utah program. Many states have a variation of all three types of programs I just briefly described. We encourage anyone to use the westernais.org website to understand what you need to know if you're moving a boat, seeking watercraft inspection and decontamination training, want to understand the regulations that exist in different states and provinces, learn the latest news about aquatic invasive species, or would like to review any of our interactive online databases, such as how, to, how and where biologists are monitoring or what rapid response plans exist to address a new introduction of aquatic invasive species. I wanted to mention a volunteer organization that's taken it upon themselves to help educate the boaters considering that over 50% of their customer base are from California. They've partnered with members like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Arizona Game and Fish, the Bureau of Rec, to create a sticker and muscle program which consists of making them aware of how to get through the California Ag stations quicker because the port of entries do include inspections of watercraft. So they educate the boater to clean off and leave their anchor out, leave the canvas off, and take steps to clean, drain, and dry before leaving. In just 52 months, they have placed over 27,000 stickers on the boat trailers to remind them of these steps. Of course, it's recommended that AIS programs conduct quality control evaluations to ensure that WID stations are continually following protocols and providing protection to those lakes. This includes providing support to the field, secret shopping of inspection stations, 
and continued on-the-job training and evaluation of customer service by those representatives. In 2014, the National Sea Grant Law Center and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies released Preventing the Spread of Aquatic Invasive Species by Recreational Boats. Its model, model legislative provisions and guidance to promote reciprocity among state watercraft inspection and decontamination programs. These model state legislative provisions were developed for two purposes. First, the provisions offer guidance to states with existing WID programs to create a foundation for multi-state reciprocity. And secondly, for states without WID programs, the provisions outline a legal framework for the authorization of new WID programs. The Western State Coordinators gathered for a building consensus workshop to complete a multi-state vision for watercraft inspection and decontamination programs. They reached consensus on the following items. Definitions for what constitutes early detection, water body definitions based on detection, notification requirements based on detections and water body definitions, triggers for states to implement management, delisting timelines for suspect positive and infested water bodies, and then definitions for self-inspection, inspection, decontamination, authorized agent, authorized location, quarantine, impound, exclusion, and field and receipt. WIT programs have been implemented in the West since early 2000s. However, it wasn't until after Lake Mead found quagga mussels in 2007 that managing agencies began utilizing WIT stations as a primary management tool to reduce the risk. Most, but not all, states west of the Hummus Meridian now have some form of WIT stations. This map reflects the models used, whether they are roadside inspections, lawn tramps, or maybe a hybrid of all of them. While there are many challenges ahead for other states in the region, Western states are working together to find some common solutions and create a system of reciprocity between other Western states and agencies. One way we are working together is through the seal and receipt program. This map reflects the seal colors of the states that the states are using. For instance, Montana is currently using white seals. The seals attach the watercraft to the trailer with either a plastic band or a wire seal, and the boater receives a receipt with the seal number. The seal tells you that the watercraft is not launched since its last inspection. The receipt is very important because it tells the next inspector what kind of inspection and or decontamination was performed in addition to when and by whom. Seals and receipts have been an incredible tool of communication and will continue to be utilized. As the West progresses in their programs, Colorado has taken the lead on providing electronic data sharing that puts boat movement into real time on devices that will show where and by whom the last inspection or decontamination was done. The program is free. Program managers purchase the site devices and get permission to access the website at different administrative levels. This map reflects data collected and reported to Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission since 2012. It shows the intercepted watercrafts by state or province that were contaminated with adult dracinid. Boat movement recorded shows that trailered watercrafts come from all over the nation. Our greatest threats are from the lower Colorado and the Great Lakes. This map is a reflection of the types of inspection stations set up in the West, including our neighbors in Canada. There are port of entry, roving, highway, launch or ramp side inspections. Some are seasonal or temporary while others can be year-round and have a more permanent infrastructure. The Watercraft Inspection and Decontamination Program is successful because of the partnerships developed. This year so far, I've performed 11 trainings in four months in six states with folks like Montana Fish and Wildlife, California Fish and Wildlife, Arizona Game of Fish, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Rec, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and the National Park Service. 
I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. You can go to the westernais.org website for further information on the, system, on the Western States training programs, and the resources and the manuals are available on this site. You can also access me through my social media sites or contact me directly for interest in WIT training in your area. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dee. Um, we're going to get set up for our next presenter. Uh, if you were trying to submit a question to the Q&A pane, um, you may have had trouble finding it. We're reopening that Q&A pane now, so you should have uh, be able to type in your questions now. Um, if you have trouble with the Q&A pane, you can also use the chat function of Skype, and we'll also check for questions in the chat as well. Um, but uh, thank you again, Dee. We're going to move to our next presenter, Dave Wick. Dave Wick is the Executive Director of the Lake George Park Commission, which is a small New York State agency solely dedicated to the long-term protection of Lake George. He has been serving in this role since 2012, after 20 years as District Manager of the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. In his role at the Park Commission, Dave has been heavily engaged in invasive species issues on Lake George, including the creation of a lake-wide mandatory boat inspection program and oversight of several invasive species control programs. He has a master's degree in hydrology and water resources management from the University of Wyoming. So welcome, Dave. Make well, sure thanks to for having me. There you go. And you should be all set to start your presentation. Okay. Let's see. All right. Well, thanks for having me out here. Um, this is a beautiful picture of Lake George. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Um, we are located in upstate New York. I'll give you a couple shots here. A little bit about Lake George. Uh, Lake George is 32 miles long, a couple miles wide. Um, it is uh, one of the significant water bodies in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains. And uh, we're very happy to try to keep it as clean as we can. Uh, if you're not familiar with upstate New York, this is what we're looking at. Uh, we're in the southeast part of the Adirondacks. Uh, Meg Modley, our next speaker, is going to be from uh, the lake just north of us, the much larger Lake Champlain. So I'll get into uh, our program a little bit. But a little bit about Lake George again. It is uh, home to a $1.6 billion regional economy. It is kind of the big economic draw uh, of the upstate uh, area on the eastern side of the Adirondacks. Uh, the picture in the middle is a Sagamore Resort, beautiful place, and it's good for fishing. And it's just a, a big uh, economic driver for everything north of Albany and south of Montreal. So keeping Lake George as clean as we can is very important, not only certainly to the ecology of Lake George, but also to the tourism. So what is Lake George Park Commission? That is my agency. It's a very small state agency. I think we're the smallest agency in the state of New York with a whopping 10 people on staff, and then we have 13 Marine Patrol. Uh, we were created by the legislature back, uh, and really started in 1961, but really became a state agency in 1987 uh, when people started realizing that the impacts to the lake uh, were starting to become fairly significant to water quality and also invasive species as milfoil was introduced to the lake in 1985, and we've been working on it ever since. So I'm the director of the agency, but we work uh, in strong partnerships with everybody around Lake George. That's all the municipalities, the not-for-profits, the chambers of commerce, and everybody else. And it's through that partnership that we got everything uh, up and running with the boat inspection program, which we're going to talk about. So what do we have in Lake George for invasive species? We have five right now. We have Eurasian water milfoil that was introduced in 1985, started managing it in 86, and we've been managing it ever since. Uh, we're over about five or six million dollars just on milfoil alone. We also have uh, Asian clams, spiny water flea, um, zebra mussels, and curly leaf pondweed. So that's what we have in the lake. Uh, we can't do anything about the spiny water flea. Uh, Asian clam, we've spent over two million dollars today to try to control, and we're struggling with that a little bit. So the goal is to keep new invasive species out. So that's where the boat inspection program comes in. So starting to take a look at some of the history, uh, what we do have in our lake is uh, considerably less than what we have in some of the lakes around Lake George, and Meg will talk some more about that. 
So what's out there? So we have quagga mussels, as Dee was just talking about. And thanks to Dee, uh, we had Dee come out and do all the training for our uh, mandatory inspection program. She was fantastic. So thanks, Dee. Um, so what's out there? We have water chestnut, Brazilian elodea, hydrilla is a big scary one that the whole region is afraid of because it is in New York uh, and it's on the move. Um, the goal is to keep these things out of Lake George. We had the benefit of um, getting a good jump start on a mandatory program thanks to the folks at the Lake George Association, which is a nonprofit organization on Lake George. It's been around uh, since 1885, actually. It's the longest standing lake uh, association in the world. So they, for about seven or eight years, had a voluntary program, Lake Stewards, uh, that were working at a few of the biggest marinas around the lake, just on a voluntary effort as uh, boaters would come in. They'd have a steward go over and talk to them. Uh, about their boat, what was the last body of water that they were in, and uh, just kind of recommended they would pull off any uh, visible um, aquatic invasive species. And um, it was largely an educational program, but it also they also had a lot of saves, they called them, which is uh, getting invasive species off of whatever boats and trailers they could find. But there was no uh, requirement for that. Um, the vast majority of people were, uh, were very good to work with. Um, in terms of the boating community. They wanted to keep Lake George clean as, as best they can. But that program uh, only addressed uh, four locations to access on Lake George, and we have about 90 access points onto Lake George. And so we started taking a look at what is out there and around us, and it became apparent that we might need to do a little bit more uh, than we had been doing for boat uh, inspections and stewards. Uh, this is a Lake George Association slide. This is just kind of taking a look at all the boaters and where they come from before they get to Lake George. So they're really from all around the Northeast. It is a popular uh, tourism hub. It is one of the most heavily recreated lakes in the Northeast. Uh, but taking a look at what is in some of those water bodies around Lake George um, is a little bit scary. So uh, this is the most common water bodies uh, that were the boats were in prior to coming to Lake George. And the, the red ones indicate um, water bodies that have more than 40 invasive species in them. And so the top two water bodies that boaters were coming to Lake George from had many of these species in them, including the Hudson River, Lake Champlain, uh, Saratoga Lake, just south of Lake George by about 30 miles. So anything red or orange has invasive species in that. So a lot of the boaters were coming to Lake George from infected waters. And this kind of gave us a good feel that we might need to take a little bit closer look. So being a state agency, uh, what we had to do is go through a full planning process and environmental impact statement. What, what are the options out there? Let's not just jump into something without taking a look at every available option. And that's what we did. Uh, we spent about a year and a half uh, going around working with uh, the communities and doing a lot of public outreach and education and involvement and got a lot of good ideas back on how uh, we really want to keep invasive species out of Lake George and what became apparent was that the economics of the issue were fairly significant, that if we get hydrilla in Lake George or quagga mussels or some of these other invasive species, the economic implications could be fairly dire uh, to property values, to trying to maintain uh, the quality of the lake in terms of maintenance of those uh, invasive species, fairly significant. And this really turned a lot of the heads on the, lo the local elected uh, municipal leadership and uh, certainly the chambers of commerce. So what were the alternatives that were out there? Uh, voluntary compliance, uh, which is really kind of the steward program that we had, maybe enhancing that a little bit. A self-certification program, just boaters saying, yes, we, we hereby certify that we're clean, drained, and dry uh, just by signing on the dotted line, but no inspection program. And then basically a mandatory inspection program, very similar to what Lake Tahoe had put in place. Uh, one of my board of commissioners had visited Tahoe and seen their program, was very impressed by it, and brought some of those concepts back. So why was it the preferred alternative? Why did our commissioners decide this is what we want to do for Lake George? Well, it is the strongest protection that we can have for Lake George. It requires that all motorized vessels uh, before they launch into Lake George be inspected just to make sure they're free of invasives. It does institute the clean, drained, and dry standard. So even if a boat is just uh, wet in the, in the bilge, even if we can't see visible aquatic invasive species, uh, we can decontaminate that boat. And the compliance is mandatory. And it doesn't rely on people saying, yeah, of course I'm clean and free of invasives. Um, and it's not a steward program where they can or cannot go through uh, any individual um, 
any visible checkpoint without having to be checked uh, thoroughly for the whole vessel. So our commissioners thought this was the program that needed to be put in place, and this is what we ultimately ended up going with. And the only reason we got there was thanks to our municipal and nonprofit partners that really helped put this program in place. How did we get there? This was pretty key. Uh, we did have 76 public uh, meetings, and this is with everybody, every Rotary, every Kiwanis, every chicken dinner that we could find, we went out to and talked to people about it and said, let's understand the issue, let's understand our ideas and our thoughts. And everybody else uh, came together and says, you know what, yeah, we think we can make this work as a region. And they did. The media really took a strong interest uh, in this. And we had multiple um, articles that come out and said, you know what, we need, to, we need to put this in place. And almost daily we had articles like this showing up in our local papers saying, you know what, we need to, we need to really address the aquatic invasive uh, threat on Lake George. And having the media behind this was extremely helpful. It was also very helpful that we had uh, the marinas on board. So we had a big meeting with all of the marinas around Lake George. We had about 45 people in attendance, all the marina owners. We walked them through this and said, this is how it could work. And they said, you know what, this seems to make sense. It's a very little burden on the local marinas themselves because they're not doing inspections. They're simply making sure that the seal is on the boat when a boater launches through uh, their facility. So this was the support we had. Uh, all of the towns around Lake George uh, to a T, all nine municipalities were letters of support for the program. The media was on board, the Chambers of Commerce were on board, the nonprofits, and only through this support were we able to pull this off. So how does it work? It's very similar to what Dee had mentioned. All trailer boats entering Lake George must be inspected. You have to stop at one of seven regional inspection stations, and your boat needs to be clean, drained, and dry. And if you're not clean, drained, and dry, no worries, because we have decontamination equipment right on site that will decontaminate your vessel at no charge to the owner. And the reason we can do that is because we have financial support from our partners. So after you go through the inspection, if it's clean, drained, and dry, you receive a seal, which is basically this right here, a little plunger seal that goes between the boat and the trailer. Then you can launch anywhere you'd like in the lake. And whoever is the manager of that launch simply clips that uh, seal, throws it in a box. We log uh, the boat number on a simple sheet and off they go. When they come back out, uh, they get resealed. So if they're just gonna put their boat in the backyard and not go no, to another water body, they show back up to Lake George, they already have their seal again, they don't need another inspection. However, if they do go to another water body, they'll have to break that seal when they come back. No worries, they'll just get another uh, inspection and decontamination if needed, and off they go. These are our seven regional inspection stations. So we took a look at the traffic patterns, what were the launch patterns, where was everybody going out, and we staffed appropriately. Uh, we're staffed at the largest launches on Lake George. Uh, we have about 55 uh, inspectors that rotate. We have about anywhere between 20 and 30 out at any given time, and we do it dawn through dusk. So what are the costs? Um, it costs us about $300,000 to get up and running. That was mostly for the decontamination units and the upgrades to the launch facilities to get, uh, we have some inspection booths uh, just so our people can get out of the sun a little bit. But it was fairly straightforward, it's just decon equipment and being able to operate at those sites. The bigger uh, nut to crack was the annual staffing cost, and that comes in around $500,000 per year. So it's not a light lift, uh, but when you break it up a little bit, among the many partners that are involved, it becomes easier. So this is Mayor Blaze on the right and myself on the left. And uh, locally, the mayor and a few other folks uh, formed this local coalition. Uh, they call themselves the SAVE group, that's Stop Aquatic Invasives from Entering Lake George. And they vowed to raise half the money for the program if uh, the governor and the state of New York would match it. And that's what happened. So the state of New York provides half of the funding, and the local municipalities and the nonprofit organizations provide the other half uh, of the funding for this program, which is outstanding. What's the impact to the voting public? Uh, to get to an inspection site is actually a little bit less than this. Uh, most of the boaters go through our inspection sites at the major launches on Lake George, so they don't have to go out of their way. Inspections take from five to seven minutes, depending, and decons take from 10 to 30 minutes. Our average time, we've gotten it actually down to between eight and 10 minutes now, which is great. And there's no additional cost to boaters on Lake George for the program, thanks to the funding partnership we have. We do have a website, uh, lakegeorgeboatinspections.com. I uh, went live just before the program started up, so I encourage you to take a look at it. 
it's the simple walkthrough where the inspection sites, what are the hours at those sites. There's a turn-by-turn -turn navigation on that uh, that's optimized for mobile phones also. And it's just kind of a, a one-stop information center for voters on the program. So what have been the results? We've been running the program. This is our fourth year. And uh, in general, we do about 10,000 uh, entrance inspections per year. And we have about a 12% decontamination rate and about 1% to 2% of the boats that we have coming to Lake George have visible invasive species on them. So we track um, the program, every single boat, uh, every site has a data logger that we take information on paper, and then when it's in downtime, we transfer that to tablets, and all those tablets' information is uploaded to one sole uh, source of information at the Commission office, and then we share that information with all of our project partners and anybody that's interested. There was a concern early on that this program might actually be driving uh, boaters away. Hey, if you're going to make them take this step, maybe they're going to go to other water bodies. Well, we have a captive audience on Lake George. Everybody that boats on Lake George uh, with a motorboat has to register that boat with the Lake George Park Commission. So we know who's out there and how many boats are coming to Lake George. And so we started the program in 2014. And as we can see, the registrations on Lake George have increased every year since we started the program. So that's not due to the program, of course, but it shows that we're not driving people away because Lake George uh, is a wonderful place to boat, and since there's really no cost uh, to them, there's no reason for them to uh, slow down the recreational opportunities on the lake itself. So in summary, it is the, the first program of its kind on a large recreational lake in the eastern United States. It's really modeled after Lake Tahoe, and we very much appreciate all their guidance and efforts on that. Um, it was originally slated to be a pilot program to see how it worked, and it worked better than any of us uh, could have hoped in terms of how we're able to process boats and the public support that we have for it. Um, it is a little bit of a house of cards in terms of funding because we rely on the local municipalities and the nonprofits and the state of New York every year for the total funding for the program, but everybody has been committed to it. There has been no hesitation from those municipalities and nonprofits to come up with their portion of the funds and we hope it continues uh, well into the future. So that's a very quick summary of the program and where we are right now, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you for the time. Thanks, Dave. Um, we did get uh, a couple of questions on the chat, and again, for those of you um, we are having some issues with the Q&A pane, so if you do have a question, in the bottom left corner of your Skype screen, there is a talk bubble that will, if you click on that, that will open the chat uh, window and you can uh, type your questions in there. Um, one, uh, the questions that we have so far are pretty general for all of our presenters, but Dave, I'll just um, ask you one um, quickly here based on your experience. Um, are you, as part of your program, um, having the boats taken off the trailer to look for aquatic plants, or do you have any comment on that approach? We don't have any way to take the boats off the trailer um, to take a look at the bunks. That's uh, probably one of the, the biggest downfalls that we have. I believe Lake Tahoe has eliminated carpeted bunks. Dee can probably answer that question. Uh, we don't have that ability right now, so any invasives that might be caught between the trailer uh, and the boat itself um, we have trouble getting at. We do uh, spend a lot of time running hot water over the bunks uh, on the trailer to make sure that if there is any small-bodied organisms, uh, they'll hopefully be killed by the 140-degree water. Uh, but that is a challenge for us, but we think the rest of the inspection and decontamination process is modeled after everything that D has put together, and we think it's fairly effective. Great. Thank you. And uh, just one other uh, question I'll float by you. Um, have you experienced any resistance or um, heard anything about a resistance to charging for fees, charging fees for decontamination if needed? Yeah, it's a, it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, there was a lot of people saying, well, you have to charge for this to make it long-term sustainable, and other folks on the other side saying, no, as soon as you start charging for it, um, it's going to be a real challenge um, because it's, it's difficult to identify uh, a boat. If the boat has simply, uh, if the bilge is just a little bit uh, damp or maybe a tiny bit of water on the bottom, and then we have to charge them $75 for decontamination, um, is that an equitable thing to do? 
and it becomes difficult for our inspectors at that point to say, you know, we really think this boat should be decontaminated, but I don't want to charge this guy 75 or $100 to decontaminate. Maybe he's fine. Let's send him along the way. We think if we can keep the cost to zero, it keeps our inspectors not afraid of upsetting the boating public uh, when they're out there, and we just think it's a stronger program as we have it right now. We hope to never have to go to a paid decontamination or inspection program. Thank you. Uh, we did get one more uh, question specifically for you, Dave, uh, at Lake George. Um, what is your season of operation? Is, is it seven days a week? It is seven days a week, and we operate from May 1st until November 30th. So actually, uh, we changed that now. We eliminated November. What we did is we took a look at the boat uh, launches in November and what was found uh, from the first two pilot years when we uh, did operate in both April and November and the costs associated with that, and we found that the scientific risk uh, of transporting aquatic invasives at that time of year was fairly low, and the cost was fairly high based on a per-boater uh, cost because there were so few launches then. So now the program is from May 1st to October 31st. Great, thanks. So I think that's all the questions we have for you at this time, so if you uh, need to depart to take care of your other uh, duties, that should be fine, um, but if you can hang on to the end for some more Q&A, um, you're welcome to do that as well. well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Our next and final presenter for uh, today is Meg Modley. Meg is the Aquatic Invasive Species Management Coordinator for the Lake Champlain Basin Program and New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. She works to coordinate management efforts to prevent the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive species in the basin. She has worked for the Lake Champlain Basin Program since 2003, and she has a degree in environmental studies and geology and a master's in public administration from the University of Vermont. Her work has included the development of the Lake Champlain Basin Aquatic Invasive Species Rapid Response Action Plan, implementing the Lake Champlain Basin AIS Management Plan, supervising the Lake Champlain Boat Launch Stewart Program, in working with local and regional partners on education and outreach campaigns for AIS. She is a member of the National Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, co-chair of the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel, and president-elect of the Northeast Aquatic Plant Management Society. Welcome, Meg. Your presentation should be up, and if you've hit star six, you should be unmuted and ready to go. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Marvelous. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been a great introduction to have Quagga D start and Dave Wick bring some attention to Lake George, uh, which is located within the Lake Champlain Basin. And now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Lake Champlain program specifically and other efforts we've worked with other partnering agencies um, and organizations in our Northeast region. Um, just to give you an idea of the watershed, you can see our watershed there outlined in, in red. Um, so we are in Vermont, New York, in the province of Quebec. Our water flows, Lake George drains into Lake Champlain, which then flows north into the Richelieu River. Um, and our landscape is smattered with thousands of lakes across the Northeast. So managing invasive species is uh, quite a challenge in our region. My organization, the Lake Champlain Basin Program, um, it's an interesting organization. We're a partnership between the US EPA, local groups, the two states, and the province of Quebec. Um, it took an act of Congress to create us. We are fully federally funded. Um, and we are here to, to coordinate water quality management through a plan called Opportunities for Action. To set the stage in terms of the pressures that are exerted on Lake Champlain and the surrounding area, um, there are quite a number of known non-native and invasive species in three main water bodies that surround us, uh, the Great Lakes system, the St. Lawrence River, and the Hudson River. Um, all have numbers higher than the known non-native and invasives in Lake Champlain, which is now at 50. Um, the main players in our region include the zebra mussel, the spiny water flea, and Eurasian water milfoil. Um, we do stick to the federal definition of an invasive being non-native and causing some kind of harm. Um, the leading entrance of invasives into Lake Champlain has been documented through canals. 
So the number of invasives usually arriving to the Great Lakes in ballast water, and then the connectivity of our system to the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence, and the Hudson via a number of man-made canal systems. The Erie Canal connects us to the Great Lakes. The Champlain connects us down south to the Hudson system. And the Chambly Canal to the north connects us to the Richelieu River and the St. Lawrence Seaway. The next leading um, cause of concern tends to be the recreational boat use of our of Lake Champlain and other surrounding water bodies. So we we follow what the science tells us, which of course is that overland movement of invasive species does occur on small watercraft. Um, and often this movement is unintentional, which then leads us to the need for education and outreach and spread prevention. Um, we also are looking at the fact that stewardship tends to be um, the most important thing to promote in our region first. So if you have resources, you want to have a steward out there looking visually um, at a boat, removing what's there, and providing that education and outreach. However, if we're cons concerned about those small-bodied organisms, we do need some high-pressure hot water units available to decontaminate those. And the challenge is how we deploy those across a very varied landscape with with thousands of lakes and some of them having many points of entry. Um, I think I covered that already except to mention that um, the different states across the Northeast have varying degrees of invasive species regulations and transport laws. Um, none of them are quite the same. Um, we tend, I tend to be jealous of the Western states coordination, trying to get everyone together and discussing the language um, in the regulations and talking a little bit more about reciprocity of the inspection and decontamination programs um, out west. So that leads us to what is in our region. Um, the Lake Champlain Boat Launch Steward Program was launched in 2007. Um, this program has grown for Lake Champlain that has other over 200 points of entry. We had four stewards when we started, two in New York and two in Vermont. It's grown to 12 stewards. Um, we are only stationed at the busiest launches around Lake Champlain. We operate primarily from Memorial Day to Labor Day. We work eight-hour days up to four days a week. So here we're deploying very limited resources to the busiest launches on the busiest days. Um, and we have permits to be at the state launches um, in New York and Vermont, and we're on a few of the um, locally owned and provincial launches on, on Missisquoi Bay in Quebec on Lake Champlain. The stewards are out there conducting a risk assessment. They ask um, some pretty uh, straightforward questions, the most important being, what's the last body of water your vessel was in the previous two weeks to help us evaluate um, how intense our, our courtesy boat inspection needs to be? Um, do you take any measures to prevent the spread of invasive species? And where do you intend to go next? Um, all of this information is collected, and there's a number of other parameters we do collect, but this is an education and outreach program. This is not enforcement. Um, based on where you are, New York, Vermont, and Quebec, there's different laws and regulations that I'll touch on, um, but we are really there providing the visitors with a greeting message, offering a courtesy boat inspection, collecting this really critical data, and all that helps us really um, prioritize where we're going to put our limited resources around Lake Champlain. So again, being focused on spread prevention, we've integrated a number of different parts to this program. Um, we have signage at water access sites. We have a cooperative boat wash program with local car washes that have um, locations, and it has the width and the height and the pressure and the temperature of the water at each of those car wash stations to help assist in areas that we can't have um, or don't have resources for decontamination stations. Um, New York DEC has come up with this little uh, disposal box um, that's stationed at most of New York DEC boat launches. It's in the, in the lower right corner. It's just a desiccation box basically for anything um, that's found on a boat or trailer so that it, it dries there instead of washes back into the lake. Um, we do early detection surveys, and we offer some free boat decontaminations, but only at limited sites. We are collecting the boat type, the state of registration, whether or not we encounter an organism, and then we later identify it so that we know what percentage of organisms collected are invasive. We ask continually every time on launch and retrieve if the boat operator takes any measures to prevent the spread of invasive species. 
And that's really critical to us, um, and the interpretation of that response is really critical, especially in the training of the stewards so that we're accurately recording if folks are taking measures to prevent the spread of invasives. And then we're asking the last body of water and the next body of water uh, to be visited. So we used to operate off of field data sheets, which was a bit of um, a management challenge because the stewards would record data on a field sheet, take it home, transcribe it into Excel, send it to the site supervisor who would then have to receive the field sheets by mail to compare to the electric, electronic sheets for quality data assurance checks. So this was fairly complex, and in 2014 uh, we launched in cooperation with Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute the SNAP Mobile Survey, which is an on, it's a survey that the stewards can collect on a tablet which is saved and then they upload it to a cloud at the end of the day. Um, we collect all kinds of really interesting data that helps us um, in evaluating risk at the different launches on Lake Champlain. The purpose of the visit is collected. Uh, we can look at the percentage of boat type use on different launches. This would help a steward understand that if they're located at one site, they're going to be seeing predominantly motorized vessels versus other sites may have um, much more varied uh, boat type usage, um, being sailboats, kayaks, canoes, et cetera, based on where they're located around Lake Champlain. The state of boat registration um, does start to tell us a bit about where folks are coming from. Mostly folks are, have their vessels registered in Vermont and New York. But we do have about 20% coming from other places. Um, and again, this isn't confirming that they're last in those bodies of water, but the state of the vessel registration. The prevention steps people are taking. Um, a lot of folks report that they inspect their boat or drain their bilge water. Many of them wash their boat and drain their live well, and less of them uh, or fewer of them are, are disposing of bait and disinfecting live wells. Um, when we're asking these questions. So this helps us prioritize our message for spread prevention. Other interesting information that we can use from the data collected tells us where we're seeing the most number of organisms at which launches. And this may be because a launch is in a protected bay where there's a very dense aquatic bed uh, near the launch site. But it is helping us understand where we would might expect to encounter the most number of invasives or organisms coming off of a boat um, or coming into Lake Champlain. And then, of course, we have it divided out by the type of species that we're seeing. And this can also help us understand which sites might be the most risky for the number of invasives and the types of invasives that we're encountering at the different sites around Lake Champlain. So the big, the big questions in terms of the, the previous water body visited and the next body of water visited is also really helpful in conducting um, some kind of priority uh, assignment of stewards and decontamination around Lake Champlain. So for example, at the Ticonderoga boat launch site um, in New York, we have had the greatest number of vessels coming from different water bodies to the Ticonderoga boat launch in the previous two weeks. So that site receives quite a pressure of um, different types of uh, water body last use. But if we look at the next body of water to be visited after Lake Champlain, Colchester Point in Vermont has that, uh, that highest number, which means folks from there exiting Lake Champlain, which has 50 known non-native invasives, are traveling to 32 varied water, water bodies across the Northeast. And that's an important point um, in terms of prioritizing stewardship and decontamination so that we are preventing the overland spread to inland water bodies. So after 10 years of this boat launch steward program on Lake Champlain, um, we have some numbers assembled. Um, we are inspecting you know, over 83,000 boats. We've talked to over 181,000 people. We've collected over 8,000 um, organisms, and about half of them have been invasive. This program has varied over time, so the effort is not equal across all years. In 2007, you can see we started with four stewards, and the number of stewards has grown. Um, in, in 2017, there will be 12 listed under, under that next year. Um, 
and the number of vessels that we inspect and the number of visitors that we see and talk to has grown over, over time. So this is a dynamic program. Again, it's spread prevention, prioritizing where we're going to put stewards at the busiest launches based on where we're seeing the greatest number of organisms, what percentage are invasive, and where the greatest number of, in, of boaters have been, excuse me, where the greatest number of previous visited water bodies are launching, um, those boats launching onto Lake Champlain and where they might be headed next. So this graphic here was created to really drive the message home that we are intersecting the greatest number of organisms on boats retrieving from Lake Champlain. We are home to those 50 known non-native invasives, and we have a lot of overland transport to uninvaded water bodies. So it's really important um, that we're checking those vessels upon exit. Of course, we do experience pressures from um, a number of those water bodies that have a greater number of non-native invasives, so we have to look at them coming and going. But again, our, we're exerting a great threat to the rest of the inland water bodies in the Adirondack region and the northeast across the state of Vermont and east um, for exiting watercraft with organisms. So this is a graphic similar to the one that Dave Witt showed um, for Lake George. This is for Lake Champlain, and it's showing the 25 most common water bodies last and next visited. And we are very connected to the St. Lawrence Lake Ontario, the Hudson system, even the Atlantic Ocean. We have a lot of visitors that come and use Lake Champlain as a bass fishing tournament destination. Many of those come from the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay, where there are quite a number of high-risk invaders that we don't have currently in Lake Champlain. So the challenges of this program are tailoring the message to different users. Um, a lot of information for the boat launch users can be overwhelming. Um, repeat users are always surveyed, um, but they may need to receive a different message. And that's why we train our stewards to be risk assessors. They have to greet folks, ask them where they've last been, pay attention to the vessel registration, how many people are in the party, um, where they think they might go next. And that helps when we have lines and lines of users in a, in a voluntary compliance-based program we will pay much more attention to a vessel last in Lake Ontario coming into Lake Champlain than one that was just in Lake Champlain yesterday. And of course, if somebody is headed out to a known uninvaded water body, we're going to recommend decontamination or drying um, so that they're not transporting anything from Lake Champlain to an inland water body. Our boat launches can be very busy, um, so that risk assessment is really important. And evaluating our success is um, it's hard because we can count saves, but it's hard to quantify the growing awareness by the public, which is why we ask that question, do you take any measures to prevent the spread of invasive species? Um, but these graphics that we've created for Lake Placid as a lake has a steward program, and this shows their interconnectedness, and Lake George, um, these really speak to a lot of those stakeholders that Dave Wick talked about. Um, a lot of the politicians and the resource managers are uh, very receptive to these maps. They drive the message home about how connected their lake of concern may be to the surrounding area and the threats that are posed to it, as well as the threat that it may pose to other lakes, um, which raises a lot of um, awareness and some funding and grant opportunities for lake associations in the, receiving, uh, in the area to receive some funds to support their programs. The boat launch steward data feeds directly back into law and policy development. Um, the region in New York and Vermont has looked at the boat launch steward data collected from the Lake Champlain program, from the Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Stewardship Program, from the Lake George program, and other inland lake associations. We have all come together to collect the same standard uh, fields of data so that we can uh, really bring all of our data together and uh, tell a much bigger story about what we're seeing as threats and pressures to the region. Um, and that information has been used um, when the states have been considering changing their regulations about invasive species transport. In particular, uh, Vermont is currently looking at some regulations um, that would mandate uh, draining of vessels before they launch and after they retrieve, which is very important because currently right now it's only illegal for vessels to transport aquatic plants, zebra mussels, and quagga mussels overland. 
New York uh, came out with a statewide regulation just two years ago that says no person shall launch their watercraft unless, unless reasonable precautions have been taken to clean, drain, and dry. And the reasonable precautions is interesting because they recommend drying for five days or using the best available technology. So if a decontamination station is available on a New York State launch and the vessel um, is a high risk, then they have to be clean, drained, and dried. They're really asked to use or required to use that uh, available technology. Um, but you'll see that vessels across, or excuse me, lake associations across the area have varying degrees of uh, decontamination available. Some have a low pressure cold water hose, and that again is good at reducing risk you know, compared to doing nothing at all. Um, and then we have everything up to high pressure hot water decontamination stations available. And in Quebec, there are no regulations about aquatic um, organism transport at this time that would be in addition, uh, in addition to their um, bait fish regulations. So there's varying degrees of rules, regulations under review, and it depends on where you are. And of course, Lake Champlain is an interstate and international water body. So if you're in New York, we can say, um, don't you know it's the law if somebody doesn't want to work with us on a launch, we can say, well, we can help you be in compliance with the law and folks quickly come around. Um, but in the state of Vermont, if it's not a plant, a zebra, or a quagga mussel, <laughs> um, that's, that's not the law necessarily. So uh, this is, you know, we, we are trying to feed our data back into the development of further regulations. So I sort of wanted to summarize what I'm talking about here in terms of voluntary compliance-based education and outreach programs for stewardship in the Northeast and on Lake Champlain with a partnership um, between the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, Paul Smith College, the Lake Champlain Basin Program, and the Lake George Association. Um, we endeavored to combine all of our boat launch steward data uh, into one um, analysis and to try and prioritize where we would place stewards and decontamination stations across the Adirondack Park in New York. And this was a report um, that was requested by New York State DEC. Um, and when we pulled all of our data together, uh, we had uh, quite a number of data points to, to combine and help us paint a picture for prioritization of very limited resources across the landscape. What resulted was, um, based on a lot of early detection and survey work conducted in the region, we know where we have aquatic invasive plants present and where we have aquatic invasive um, small-bodied organisms present. What the boat launch steward data did was it brought the um, addition of information about transport in between these different water bodies. So when we crunched all of our data together for the New York Adirondack region, what we saw was we have a number of what we're calling invasion spread hubs. Um, and these are lakes that have aquatic invasive species present with outbound traffic to uninvaded water bodies. So we were able to highlight with the red circles um, our invasion spread hubs in the region. In addition, our data helped us highlight which lakes serve as linkage lakes, meaning there's a lot of traffic to and from um, a grouping of lakes in this region by a certain linkage lake. Um, and then we added to that the elevation or the priority of the water bodies that had small, organ small bodied organisms present. So in particular, would be focused on zebra mussels and spiny water flea um, and Asian clam to elevate where we might place limited resources across the landscape. Then, so maps started developing. Um, we saw lots of uh, linkage between Lake Champlain, for example, and Chattagay Lake in the northern part of the Adirondack Park, Lake Placid, um, sort of getting into a little bit more of the interior of the park and to um, Saratoga Lake. So we can see that Lake Champlain as a linkage lake is connected to those three regions of the park. Um, and we've, we've found a number of these linkage lakes um, really connecting travel of vessels in and around our region. And this is all based on the last body of water that was visited and the next anticipated body of water to be visited. 
So this map helped us prioritize where we might station road sto roadside decontamination stations. And we are now phasing out of our pilot program and really into an implement implementation stage of putting decon stations on major road arteries in and out of the park based on this data and at those important invasion spread hubs with small-bodied organisms with outbound traffic to uninvaded water bodies. So our program has grown considerably in the Adirondack region. There's now over 100 stewards and decontamination technicians around the region uh, operating today. Um, our success is benefiting from um, we, we train together. We uh, stick to consistent messaging together. We use the same materials so that if a, a visitor is on Lake Placid, they will receive a similar message and be asked similar questions as they might be on Lake Champlain, even though those stewards may be supervised by two different program managers. Um, we've gone so far as to try to coordinate our uniforms. Um, and again, we do stick to some base data collection that allows us to compare our programs together. We have also had great success by the number of retu returning stewards that come back to our program year after year. I have one steward who's been with me for 11 years, which is extremely helpful. They know the program in and out. Um, they become very familiar with talking to folks who are, you know, want more information or don't want to talk to them about this program. Um, they've really uh, solidified their message to these different types of users. And the funding, um, a lot of the data and the reporting has gone back to support new granting programs coming from the state and from the region um, to support these programs. And in certain areas, it's become an expectation that we will have stewards available. And hopefully, it will become an expectation eventually that we'll have some decontamination stations available that aren't too far away. But unlike Lake George, where the Lake George Park Commission has full authority over all the launch sites onto the lake, you know, we have varied regulations across our region. So that kind of a program would be um, impossible to implement across our region. So I think I'll end by um, the same message of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Our boat launch stewards are out there addressing all taxa. I'd say aquatic plants are just as much, if not more, of a problem than the small-bodied organisms. And the clean, drain, dry message, sticking to that national message and looking at what programs are doing out west um, has really supported the development of a model that's working to address the landscape level spread of invasive species in the Northeast based on limited resources. We've really worked with this data collection to prioritize where we're going to be putting um, our limited resources. And it's, it's, a, it's a development, it's a, development, a de developing program. Um, I think we've had great success, uh, but we, we need to continue um, and spread this, this message and the program across the Northeast. Thank you, Meg. Uh, that concludes our presentations for today. Uh, we do have some questions that have been submitted. And just to reiterate, you can submit questions using the chat uh, option of Skype. And that is accessible in the bottom left corner of your Skype window. There is a talk bubble icon. If you click that, it will open the chat window. And you'll be able to type in your question there. Uh, so Meg, I'm going to direct this first question to you. Um, one of our attendees noticed that there uh, appeared to be a decrease in compliance in 2016 and wanted to know if you had any comments on that. Yeah, I, I do. We um, expanded the program again in 2016 to cover a few more sites that we hadn't been at previously on Lake Champlain. And we think we saw that drop in compliance because we were interviewing and spreading the message to users who hadn't received the message before. So I think that caused uh, sort of a dip in the responses. Um, and we would hope that over the next few years it would come up again. But every time the program grows, we see a little dip in the response of people taking spread prevention measures, me uh, measures because I think we're reaching out to new people who haven't received that message before. Thanks. Um, this question I'm going to direct um, either to Meg or to Dave if you're still with us. And just a reminder, Dave and 
uh, D, if you could hit star six to unmute your lines, um, then you uh, will be able to answer these questions. Uh, but this next question is about uh, the program in New York. And the question is, are there penalties in place, for example, impoundment or a monetary fine, if boats launch without having demonstrated compliance uh, with best practices for decontamination? I don't know if Dave's on. I don't think he is, so I will take a crack at it. So there is a penalty associated with the new statewide regulation. As far as I know, they haven't um, used that except for any egregious launch, meaning somebody warned them, they were ignored, and then they had to call somebody to come um, and handle that. And unfortunately, that would be after the fact, right? They've already launched, and that's, and that's too bad. That's very unusual, I think. For the most part, these are new regulations in the Northeast and in New York, and so they are starting out with a compliance-based approach. Um, they would usually an enforcement officer would educate the individual, and if they're difficult, they would um, they would provide that penalty or fine. But that is um, up to the. I think there's a maximum amount, and I have to look it up, but it's at the discretion of the officer who's involved. Thanks, Meg. Uh, I'm going to open this question up to any of our presenters. Um, and there was a question about, um, are folks aware of any other regional AIS inspection models in place uh, besides the ones that were talked about today, uh, including Lake George, Lake Tahoe, and Champlain? I mean, I know that there are other ones out there. Um, some folks are trying to work with the self-certification program in other New England states, especially around areas where we have known invasive species infestations, or um, currently there's some kind of a quarantine underway. Um, so I know Massachusetts was working with the self-certification program, especially, I, you know, they, they also had quarantine Quabbin Reservoir when zebra mussels were found there. Um, other lakes programs are mostly working on where resources are available, and that's, that's the challenge is if you have an organized lake association with some funds, they can maybe afford a steward at a busy launch on their lake. If there's you know, more than one, they have to choose the busiest launch. Um, with our program in the Adirondacks, the idea was follow the data and follow the science. And so if it's saying that there's a lake that's a high risk with outbound traffic, to uninvaded water bodies, the program and all the partners would get behind supporting putting a steward there, even if there weren't local lake association funds there um, to support it. So it's it's taking more of a regional approach to moving your resources where, where we really think the highest risks exist. Um, and I know there's a good program um, in Minnesota. There, there are many good programs out there. Um, the challenge is how do you how do you network them all together and get all of the data shared so that you can use it to improve the program? Right, and we did receive a, a comment early on about um, a Minnesota pilot program um, that was spearheaded uh, by Wildlife Forever uh, to provide tools for boaters to clean, drain, and dry. And there, so there's a link for information that program in the chat window if folks want to take a look at that. Um, and I'll also just put in another plug. Um, we are, like I said at the beginning, planning a second webinar to feature additional programs that are out there. Um, our next webinar will focus primarily on programs in the Great Lakes region, uh, as we heard from the Western and Northeast uh, today. So just put another plug out there for that. Um, Dee, were you able to unmute your line in case you want to respond to these questions? I am unmuted, I believe. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In response to the Minnesota equipment, I love that it's a tool for educating the boater and having it available to the boater. It uh, basically is, from my understanding, like a vacuum. So you're vacuuming up any standing water, but there isn't any hot water application to it, from my understanding. 
Well, and like I said, hopefully we can get into additional details on our, our follow-up webinar. Um, I wanted to go back to a question that, um, Dave, that I addressed to Dave earlier, uh, but wanted to see Meg or Dee if you had any additional comments. Um, one is about, um, again, the issue of charging fees for decontamination when needed, uh, if you have any reactions to that question. Uh, this is Dee. In the West, what we've done is added, uh, some states have added an additional fee to their boating registration, and that's how they're funding their programs. Lake Tahoe does charge for their decontaminations. So in the Northeast, a number of states have looked at adding fees to the boat registration fee. It's usually shot down at every um, every angle. Um, mostly the politicians don't want any increase in funds for registration fees and other um, other boating trade associations and lobbyists will um, oppose it. So we've worked as hard as we can on education outreach and compliance. Um, and then you know the model that is working on Lake George where you have local investment plus state investment matched is really a winning situation. That took a, a lot, a lot of hard work. Um, I think if we continue to collect the data and show the importance of the program and the risks that are associated, um, that might help to educate folks about, or at least inform them about what's at stake versus what it costs to manage something once it gets in. That may have a little bit more weight in the future if we can continue to increase that, um, that data to help support that idea of increasing a registration fee. Um, but mostly it's been not uh, not favored in the Northeast. Um, so that's what I know. We're not we're, because we're not a mandatory program. We also don't don't charge for it. So the the other question that um, I addressed to Dave, but again would open it back up to both of you if you had additional comments, was the issue of uh, removing a boat off the trailer to address trapped aquatic plants and how you handle mm -hmm. that with your program. I'm not aware of any inspection or decontamination programs at this time that are lifting the boat off the trailer unless they're going to a boat yard and the boat yard is doing the, doing additional work like bottom paint, then they're putting it on blocks. Yeah, from the Lake Champlain region perspective in the Northeast, I mean, that is one of the biggest challenges that we face is, no, we do not have the resources to address um, looking at what's pinched between the boat and the trailer. The best we can do is get underneath, plus the carpeted bunk situation is very challenging. And I think the best that we can do is hope to um, make some advancements in technology and see if there's another material other than carpet bunked, bunked, um, carpeted bunks that would be um, maybe less likely to transport invasive species. But we do not have a way to address that, and it's, it's a big challenge. Thanks. Um, another question that has come in is about um, if the presenters have any thoughts or comments on um, limiting a boat to one lake per season. Well, um, in, in our region, at least for the programs that are participating in SEALs like Lake George, if, one, if the boat's only using Lake George, then it doesn't have to go through continual inspection and decontamination. It can launch. Um, that's the beauty of that SEAL program. Um, the boats that are launched and kept on moorings obviously don't have to go back and forth through, through stewardship um, interactions, but for the rest of the region, um, there's no way to determine whether or not you know a boat is um, on on a lake for one season or not, um, and and our stewardship doesn't cover 24/7, which is also a challenge. Um, I don't know about limiting it to one lake in terms of regulations for meaning like a registration, um, but I think we're a very long way away from that. I don't think that would be very well accepted in the Northeast because boats tend to hop around on different lakes very frequently here. As a boater, I, str I would struggle with that. You know, we are protecting the natural resources, but we do have that 
mindset that it's freedom to boat, and we've seen that trailered watercrafts come from all over the place, and I think that you are impacting your local economy by limiting the lake, per, well, the boats per season. Thank you both. Uh, I believe that concludes all the questions that we've received for today. Um, so before we wrap up, I would just ask uh, both Meg and Dee if you have any other thoughts that you wanted to share or emphasize before we wrap up for the day. Um, Meg, anything else you wanted to say? Um, I did say there was a question earlier about the Lake George program, and it is a program that runs I believe from April or close from ice out all the way through late October. So it does cover nearly all of the, of the boating season. Um, the staffing drops down in the shoulder seasons. Um, but in terms of the, the Lake Champlain and the Adirondack model, um, I think we are going to keep trying to expand our program and get more data points and see if we can um, come up with more recommendations for informing resource managers about how to use limited resources to really intercept the most invasive species from moving across our landscape. Thank you. Dee, any concluding thoughts from you? Yeah, I saw another comment about the questions were addressed, but the answers weren't so great, and I apologize if it was me. I'm wondering if it's about the thoughts of limiting a boat to one lake per season. We have used the model of offering boats to rent if they don't aren't able to launch because they had standing water and the program didn't have the ability to decontaminate. So I'm not quite sure why that answer wasn't. Uh, I would like to be able to answer that question a little bit better for him. Um, well, if I, if you're willing, we can uh, make your contact information available as part of the um, recap posting on our website with the recording of this webinar, and I think uh, folks can follow up with you individually if that's all right. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, again, I want to thank all three of our uh, speakers uh, for presenting today. Uh, a reminder to be on the lookout for our part two of this webinar. Um, thanks to all of our attendees as well. And a final reminder that the webinar has been recorded, will be posted on the Invasive Muscle Collaborative website in the next day or so. And if you have additional follow-up or questions or comments, uh, please feel free to contact us or our speakers. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and that concludes our webinar for today.